I don't have a patriotic uh, sermon to go with our patriotic theme service because we're in the middle. In fact, we're exactly halfway through this uh, series of sermons on the fruits of the Spirit, which you'll recall uh, are listed by Paul in a short passage from Galatians 5, 22 and 23. Once more, I'd like for us to join together in reading these verses. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, generosity, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Today we're looking at the fruit of kindness, and as we do so, I'd like for us to hear the words of Ephesians 4.32. Be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, as God in Christ has forgiven you. Now each week I've been quoting you know, great theologians and wonderful Bible scholars for reference. Uh, today, I'll quote another one of my favorites, someone who might be classified as a practical theologian. His name was Fred Rogers, better known as Mr. Rogers of Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood. And in case you didn't know, uh, Fred Rogers was in fact an ordained Presbyterian minister. Mr. Rogers said this, there are three ways to ultimate success. The first way is to be kind. The second way is to be kind. The third way is to be kind. I like that advice. I don't know about you, but the kind of success that I want to find in life is success which has kindness as its foundation. I'll also remind you that there is an insert with sermon notes that helps some people follow along and uh, maybe help them to remember some of the things we discussed today. So as as we begin, let us pray. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O God, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. It was spring of 1989. I was the associate pastor at the church down in Metropolis. And one morning I received a phone call from a Reverend Merle Nance in the conference office in Mount Vernon. Some of you might know Merle. Uh, He's around the church once in a while. Merle wanted to know if I might be willing to serve as a volunteer camp counselor at a summer camp for children. I was much younger and much more naive, and without hesitation, I said, yes, of course. So later that summer, I found myself at fledgling camp down at Little Grassy Lake. Fledgling camp was a three-day, two-night program that allowed third and fourth graders to have their first experience at church camp. I figured I could handle that. Three days and two nights. As it turned out, those three days and two nights seemed more like three years and two months. (laughs) It was unseasonably hot. I was sunburned, I was bug bitten, I was absolutely miserable. I hate to admit it, but my chubby thighs chafed, which made for an interesting visit with the camp nurse. (laughs) In my group of five boys, and I was the only adult in charge of them, I had a couple of kids from Cairo, cousins in fact, who were absolute smart alecks and were stirring up trouble all the time. I really had my hands full. Those three days seemed like an eternity, and I couldn't wait to get home and away from all this. The bright spot in that short week at Fledgling Camp was a woman named Sharon, who was our camp director. Sharon lives in Centralia, and many of you know her. Without hesitation, Sharon consistently responded to my whining and complaining with undeserved sympathy and compassion. When I went to her with these smart-mouthed brats in my group, she gave them the kind of attention that must have made them feel like they were the most important persons in the world. One boy in particular, whom I couldn't seem to control or corral, instantly warmed up to Sharon's loving spirit and became amazingly calm in her presence. It was truly a remarkable thing to see. Needless to say, Sharon made a deep impression on me during those three days at fledgling camp because she seemed so full of something that I didn't seem to have. A couple of years later, I was appointed as the associate pastor at Sharon's church in Centralia, 
And we became very good friends and we remain friends to this day. But I believe that I can say that among my many friends and acquaintances, Sharon is someone who radiates kindness probably more than anyone else. In fact, I dare say she's someone in whose life I recognize most, if not all, the fruits of the Holy Spirit. They're actively present in her life. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, generosity, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. And I know that her kindness to me and her kindness to that troubled kid at fledgling camp many years ago really made an impression that, that lasts to this day. Let me ask, are you needing a little more kindness in your heart today? Today we arrive at the fifth fruit listed by Paul as a fruit of the Spirit, kindness. Kindness is a quality, a disposition, an active attitude that God's Holy Spirit wants to grow and cultivate within your life and mine. You know, the meaning of the word kindness in itself shouldn't need too much explanation. If you look up synonyms in the dictionary, you'll find words like graciousness, hospitality, understanding, unselfishness, thoughtfulness, graciousness, hospitality. Understanding, unselfishness, thoughtfulness, those are the kinds of things that make for kindness. The New Interpreter's Bible, the New Interpreter's Dictionary of the Bible points out that the Hebrew word for kindness, which is often translated as mercy, focuses more on action than feeling, like showing mercy to someone. Kindness, you see, is something you do. Kindness is something you do. In that classic and wonderful verse from Micah, Micah 6, 8, the prophet declares, He has told you, O mortal, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you but to do justice and to love kindness and to walk humbly with your God? What does God expect of us? Quite simply, to do the right thing, which is doing justice, to love kindness, love mercy, as King James puts it, and to walk humbly, to walk in humbleness with God. I dearly love that verse. Another scripture reminds us that kindness is a part of God's own character. Psalm 145 verse 17 declares, The Lord is righteous in everything He does. He is filled with kindness. Listen to that. God is full of kindness toward us. And you see, as an attribute of God, when we act in kind ways, we're imitating God's characters. We're reflecting and showing who God is. In the New Testament, there's a passage in Colossians 3 that I often read at weddings. It sounds a lot like Galatians when Paul describes the fruit of the Spirit. Colossians 3.12 says, As God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, meekness, and patience. You know, often when we start the day, we worry about what we wear on the outside. But Paul is suggesting that we might want to consider the attitude we're going to wear on the inside throughout the day. And Paul says, clothe yourselves with compassion and kindness. Again, in Paul's love chapter, 1 Corinthians 13, he adds kindness as one of the distinguishing qualities of love. Love is patient and kind. And again, in Ephesians, that letter in which Paul addresses divisions within the early church, he gives these instructions about how to live together in Christian community. He says, put away from you all bitterness and wrath and anger and wrangling and slander together with all malice and be kind to one another. Be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another as God in Christ has forgiven you. Once more, that's what the church, any church, should aspire to be like and to become. A community of people who put aside those bad, divisive, and selfish attitudes and instead choose to be kind and tenderhearted and forgiving. Are you needing a little more kindness in your heart today? Do we need a little more kindness in the church? 
John Wesley, Methodism's father and founder, speaks of kindness in a sermon on love, referring back to 1 Corinthians 13, where it also says love doesn't envy. Wesley says, for kindness and envy are inconsistent. They can no more abide together than light and darkness. If we earnestly desire all happiness to all people, we cannot be grieved at the happiness of any. In other words, kindness cannot coexist with envy. If we're truly filled with kindness, we must never envy or resent the good things that others experience or receive. Kindness desires the best for everyone. In his plain account of Christian perfection, Wesley describes what a mature Christian looks like. And Wesley says, he cannot speak evil of his neighbor any more than he can lie either for God or man. He cannot utter an unkind word of anyone, for love keeps the door of his lips. I like that. Love is the doorkeeper for one's mouth. I've often needed that doorkeeper to help me watch my words sometimes. So again, my brothers and sisters, are you needing a little more kindness in your heart today? Do you struggle with bitterness or envy or bad feelings toward others and find kindness a hard thing to grasp? Do you have trouble, like I often do, with unkind words that sometimes come out of your mouth and, and hurt others? Do you need the help of the Holy Spirit to come into your heart and grow the fruit of kindness within you? When I was a seminary student, I served a year-long internship at the First United Methodist Church in Marion, Illinois. This is about 1986 and 87. At one of their wonderful potlucks, they began singing some old gospel hymns, some of which I had never heard in my suburban growing up. And one of those hymns I quickly fell in love with, I'll bet some of you may remember as well. It's titled, Make Me a Blessing. Do any of you remember that old Make me a blessing. I love that. The first verse says, Out in the highways and byways of life, many are weary and sad. Carry the sunshine where darkness is rife, making the sorrowing glad. And the chorus, Make me a blessing, make me a blessing. Out of my life may Jesus shine. Make me a blessing, O Savior, I pray. Make me a blessing to someone today. I'd like you to take out that dove that should be in your bulletin this week, that paper dove. And on one side is printed the word kindness, along with a a verse from Zechariah that says to show kindness and mercy to one another. This week, on the blank side of that dove, I'd like for you to write the words, make me a blessing. And do that now if you could. If you're a guest or a visitor, we've been doing this every week now for about four weeks. And again, place that dove in in a spot where you'll see it frequently and allow those words to become a simple prayer to God in the coming days. Make me a blessing. Make me a blessing. You might want to try the breath prayer that I, I, I introduced to you a few weeks ago. Breathing in and out. Make me a blessing. Now, for those of you who may be a little bit more out of the box, I found a prayer exercise that some of you may want to try. And this comes from an email newsletter I received just this past week from Sister Joan Chittister, who's a Benedictine nun. She suggests a sentence that you speak silently to everyone and everything you see. Everyone and everything you see. And she further suggests doing this for 30 days and seeing what happens to your soul. That sentence is this. I wish you happiness now and whatever will bring happiness to you in the future. Could we say that together? I wish you happiness now and whatever will bring happiness to you in the future. Sister Joan says, if we set it to the sky we would have to stop polluting. If we set it to the ponds and lakes and streams, we would have to stop using them as garbage dumps and sewers. 
If we said it to small children, we would have to stop abusing them even in the name of training. If we said it to people, we would have to stop stoking the fires of enmity around us. Beauty and human warmth would take root in us like a clear, hot June day. We would change. And what might change is that we could end up being a little more kind to the world and to the people around us. I wish you happiness now and whatever will bring happiness to you in the future. My brothers and sisters, let's open up our hearts and lives to the Holy Spirit so that God might begin to grow the fruit of kindness within us and among us. And let's also remember the words of Jesus who says, My Father is glorified by this, that you bear much fruit and become my disciples. After my closing prayer, I have a brief video to show you on the topic of kindness. Just a couple of minutes. George Saunders, a professor of English, delivered a commencement speech recently at Syracuse University, and the topic of the speech was kindness. This short video contains some parts of that speech, and it's his voice you'll be hearing uh, in the narration. First service, it stopped after about 30 seconds. Hopefully, you'll get to watch the whole thing. Let us pray. Holy Spirit, again, we open our hearts and lives to you. Work within us and among us that the fruit of kindness might grow and mature. Help us to remember, God, that you are full of kindness. And help us likewise to clothe ourselves with the kindness and the compassion you want to grow within us. Come, Holy Spirit, come, we pray. Amen. I'd say, as a goal in life, you could do worse than try to be kinder. In seventh grade, this new kid joined our class. In the interest of confidentiality, her name will be Ellen. Ellen was small, shy. She wore these blue cat's eye glasses that at the time only old ladies wore. When nervous, which was pretty much always, she had a habit of taking a strand of hair into her mouth and chewing on it. So she came to our school and our neighborhood and was mostly ignored, occasionally teased. Your hair tastes good, that sort of thing. I could see this hurt her. I still remember the way she'd look after such an insult. Eyes cast down, a little gut kicked, as if having just been reminded of her place in things, she was trying as much as possible to disappear. After a while, she'd drift away, hair strands still in her mouth. Sometimes I'd see her hanging around alone in her front yard as if afraid to leave it. And then she moved. That was it. One day she was there, next day she wasn't. End of story. Now, why do I regret that? Why, 42 years later, am I still thinking about it? Relative to most of the other kids, I was actually pretty nice to her. I never said an unkind word to her. In fact, I sometimes even mildly defended her. But still, it bothers me. What I regret most in my life are failures of kindness. Those moments when another human being was there in front of me, suffering, and I responded sensibly, reservedly, mildly. Or to look at it from the other end of the telescope, who in your life do you remember most fondly with the most undeniable feelings of warmth? Those who were kindest to you, I bet. But kindness, it turns out, is hard. It starts out all rainbows and puppy dogs and expands to include, well, everything.
I hope it's okay to acknowledge a guest in worship this morning. We have the Reverend Brad Henson and his wife Donna with us on their first Sunday of retirement. First Sunday, they didn't have to pay him to go to church, and here he is. So we're delighted to, to have them among us and wish them well in their retirement ahead. This service is ended, but our life in God goes on and on. May your faith be so real, your joy so obvious, that all who see you will come to praise God. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, let us go in peace. Amen. <laughs> 